In this video, we're going to discuss the kinetics for reactions that can occur in either the forward or backward direction. So a reversible reaction, as I said, can go both forward and backward. If I have some reactant A and some product B, that would be indicated by this situation here. You have the double arrow, which is generally used for certain equilibrium type reactions. And it has some rate constant in the forward direction, K1. It has some rate constant in the reverse direction, K minus 1. So we're interested in the equilibrium of this reaction. So at equilibrium, what you have is that the time derivative of the concentration of A, which is equal through stoichiometry through minus the time derivative of the concentration of B, that those are both equal to zero. Because at equilibrium, you have reached the point where the reaction is no longer changing and all uh, thermodynamic values have reached their minima. So you had a minimum Gibbs energy at equilibrium. And if we looked at the reaction constant for this reaction in terms of concentrations, that would be the product raised to the power of its stoichiometric coefficient, which is I've just used as one in this case, so BQ, divided by, and then the reactant, which just also has a coefficient of one. So it this is our equilibrium constant. And because this reaction occurs in the both in the forward and the backward direction, that is sometimes referred to as a dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic in the sense that things are still moving. You still have A and B molecules moving back and forth, but on average they cancel each other out and the net rate is zero in their change. As many, as many A molecules are going to B as B are going to A. So the reaction never stops, it just reaches a value where its rates are equal. Okay, so if we wrote the, how the, react, the rate of A changes over time, it's a reactant so it disappears. So if we had minus dA dt, its concentration or molarity, how that changes over time, that equals the rate law for the forward reaction, which is K1 times A, and let's just assume that it's first order in the forward direction. And then you have to add in also the rate law for the reverse direction, and in the reverse direction it's a product, so it's being created, but since I put the minus sign there, I'm going to add the minus sign there. And that is K to the minus 1, K minus 1 times the concentration of B because the rate of A that's getting produced by the reverse reaction, if we assume that it's first order in B, is you have B molecules uh, at this rate, K minus one, being created, uh, going back to A. Okay, so to denote that, just as I said, that is the forward reaction rate law, and that is the reverse reaction rate law. Okay, so that's our rate law. So um, some things in terms of stoichiometry. So if we assume at the beginning, so assume at t equals zero, that is a very bad at. Okay, assume at t equals zero that our concentration of A is equal to some value called A naught and our concentration of B is zero. So we're starting out with just having all of it as A and none of it as B. And then over time, what we're gonna have is our concentration of B is going to equal A naught minus A because they're one to one in stoichiometry. So it's gonna be whatever a there was initially minus however much is left because the total number of moles will be constant here because these are both one to one in their stoichiometry. Okay, so if that's all true, then what we can do here is replace with B, we can re uh, replace that with A naught minus A. And then once you factor out that equation, what you're gonna get is that the minus derivative of A with time is going to equal K1 plus K minus 1 times the concentration of A, 
minus k minus 1 times concentration of A at time equals 0. Okay, so this is a situation where you could set up for an integrated rate law. I'm not going to solve it explicitly because it does take some algebra, about a page of algebra to do. But if you solve this integrated rate law, just as we have solved others for uh, zero first and second order reactions, the integrated rate law that you end up getting is your concentration of A as a function of time is equal to your equilibrium concentration plus, which remember our equilibrium concentration is just whatever value this goes to asymptotically, whatever, val whatever concentration A has after a long period of time, our equilibrium value, after the reaction has completed, times parentheses, initial concentration, minus equilibrium concentration. So however different the initial and equilibrium concentrations of A end up being, that's this term there, times E to the minus. And what is our rate constant up here in our exponent for this first order reaction? This exponent, if you work that out, it actually ends up coming from this part right there. And it's going to be K1 plus K minus 1 times t. So the effective rate of this reaction is actually a sum of the forward and reverse rates. So um, the fact that this reaction is reversible actually uh, increases the rate at which we reach whatever equilibrium we reach. Okay, so that's that there. So what this effectively does is um, this integrated rate law here, if you do some measurements and then calculate some values. This gives you the sum of k1 and k minus one. So you don't know what the you don't know what the what their what k1 or k minus one is from just measuring the reaction rate. But if you measure the reaction rate, what you have there according to this integrated rate law is you have the sum of those two values. But what else do we know about our rates. We know that it, at equilibrium these rates are going to be equal to each other. So the forward reaction rate and the reverse reaction rate, we know that those are going to be equal to each other at equilibrium. So at equilibrium we have, let me just mention, put that at the front of the line there again. At equilibrium K1 times concentration of A which is the rate law for forward reaction, equals k to the minus 1 times concentration of B, rate law for the reverse reaction. Each of those are equilibrium values for concentration. So if we divide the, uh, both sides by the values we need to get to this next step, you have the equilibrium concentration of B So equilibrium concentration of B divided by equilibrium concentration of A, that is going to be equal to K1 over K minus 1. I'm just dividing both sides by, let's see, I'm dividing both sides by B and by K minus 1 there. Yep, and you'll notice this value, uh, Concentrate, equilibrium concentration of B, equilibrium concentration of A is equal to our equilibrium constant. So it's equal to Kc. So that's another thing worth noting here is that for reversible reactions, your equilibrium constant is equal to the rate of the forward reaction divided by the rate of the reverse reaction. So this actually gives the ratio of K1 and K2. So you have the ratio of K1 and K2 from the equilibrium constant of the reaction determined by their equilibrium concentrations. And you have the sum of them determined by the integrated rate law, which you can get by measuring how fast this reaction occurs. So if you do that, you measure initial concentrations, you measure equilibrium concentrations, and you measure concentrations at some time in between, 
then you'll get both the sum of k1 and k minus 1 and their ratio. And that gives you two equations and you have two unknowns. So you can actually solve for k1 and k2 if you do those three things. You need the initial rate concentrations, you need the equilibrium concentrations, and you need some measurement at some time in between.